Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Good morning, church. Today's message is called War Room. We're going to be focusing on the importance of prayer with a busy schedule. We're going to be continuing our study in the Gospel of Mark, so please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to be focusing on verses 32 to 35. From these passages, we will focus on working hard, starting early, and making time. Before we get into the text, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we have the opportunity to spend this time in your word, we ask you to open our minds and help us understand the importance of prayer. Help us to understand that importance of communicating with you and seeking your direction and guidance. Help us always, Heavenly Father, to understand your word. Guide us and help us. Help us when we preach your word that we may be preaching it faithfully. Help us when we're sharing the gospel, that we're reaching the lost and we're edifying those who are already believers. Heavenly Father, we ask for your help we know that you are a sovereign and mighty God. So we lean on you, we trust in you, and we thank you for your precious son. And we pray this now in your precious son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Colonel Gardner consistently woke up at 4 a.m. and entered his closet, where he read, meditated, and prayed until 6 a.m. Through keeping his committed time with God, he acquired a fervency of spirit, as says his biographer. I believe few men living ever attained. This certainly contributed to his firm faith in God and reverent steadfastness, which carried him through the trials and services of life with such steadiness. For he indeed in endured and acted as if always seeing him who is invisible. If at a time he was obligated to go out before six in the morning, he rose proportionately sooner, so that when a journey or a march required him to be on horseback by four, he would be at his devotions by two. Now this is a wonderful story here, church, that we see the commitment to starting the day off right in prayer. And that even if you have something early that you have other obligations to do, and that just means wake up even earlier. That time is so important because that shows our dedication and, and, and listening to what God is telling us and really showing our reliance on Him. And as we go through our scripture today, we're going to see how Jesus modeled that perfectly for us. So our text again is Mark chapter 1, verses 32 to 35, which reads, when evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. And this takes us now to our very first point, working hard. So the crowds, so let's take a look at verses 32 to uh, 34. And in these verses, we're going to see that the crowds that came to Jesus, they actually came after sunset. The reason was because they did not want it to conflict with the Sabbath. So even though Jesus himself was doing miracles on the Sabbath, many of those who were listening to the rabbis of what they said about the Sabbath, that to not travel and so forth, they were holding on to their sick, especially those who didn't have life-threatening sicknesses, and waiting until after the Sabbath had passed, which would have been after sunset, to take them to Jesus. And if we turn to Luke's account, we're actually going to see we get a little bit more detail on what exactly happened. So if you'll turn to Luke 4, verses 42 to 44, it reads, When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him, and came to him, and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. 
So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So we see here that Jesus was so focused on his work and his mission. His mission was to preach the kingdom of God. We see that, again, from our previous studies in Mark, we see that the miracles that he was doing, healing the sick and exercising those demons, were meant to point to his authority in his teaching. So we see how focused Jesus was in his, his mission. And, and that's what he kept repeating over and over again. And he kept stressing, and that's what he kept doing. And that's what his miracles were really pointing to. We also know that his miracles were fulfilling prophecy. In Matthew 8, 16 to 17, that reads, When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Now here Matthew is referring to, in the Old Testament, to Isaiah, and specifically Isaiah 53, 4, which reads, Surely our grief he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And that just gives us a little bit of a background, and that also shows us Jesus' dedication, again, to focusing on his work at hand. Okay, And that teaches us that we must be focused and dedicated to the service that God has called us to do. So we have to ask ourselves first, what have we been called to do? And once we realize this, we have to use our gifts, not burying it, but using it to preach God's word. Okay, All of us are needed, and we all have different areas of the church in which we serve. We are his hands and feet. We are his fingers. We are different parts of the body, but we are all focusing on that same goal, which is to spread the gospel message. So our job is to be faithful. Uh, that means to go out there, okay, use our talents, okay, focus on our work, and he's going to do the blessing. He's going to soften the hearts. He's going to bring people in. Okay? When a person is being faithful in what they're doing, for example, they may use their talents okay, and bring somebody to church uh, by what they've done. And once they come to church, they listen to the worship music, which is another person using their gift. They listen to the preacher preaching, which is another person using their gift. They're greeted by different people in the church. They're involved in Sunday school with another person using their gift. The whole process is different people using their gifts that they have in order to make disciples. So it's important to always focus on what is your actual job? What is God calling you to do? And work hard to do it. And that's our first point of working hard. And now this takes us to our second point, starting early. Verse 35 reads, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house. So there is a consistent theme all throughout Scripture to rise up early and pray. Okay, And we need to focus on being early to serve and to pray to our Lord. We'll see in Psalms 5, Verse 3, it reads, In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayers to you and eagerly watch. Okay, here's the, the psalmist is telling us what he's doing. And this is a great model for us to do. Start your day off right and start your day in communication with the Lord. And we see in Psalm 88, 13, But I, O Lord, have cried out to you for help. And in the morning, my prayer comes before you. Cry out to him. This is important for us to realize when you're going through your troubles in, in, in this world. Don't just seek different places and, and, and think to yourself, well, why can't I get any help in this? First, turn to God. Many times, we don't turn to him first. Many times, we'll try to get some advice. Or we'll try to figure it out on our own. And we'll try to think of ways out of it. And we don't realize, did, did we ever consult our God? In your, when you wake up in the morning, plead to him your prayer. Beg him. Tell him, Lord, this is the plate that has been given to me. Lord, help me. You are a sovereign God. You are in control of everything. Help me, Lord. Okay? Start your days off pleading with him your desires, your, your, your struggles, your pains, your cries, your praise. Okay? But it's not just in the morning that we're supposed to pray for him. Psalm 55, 17 reads, Evening and morning and at noon, I will complain and murmur, and he will hear my voice. 
That means all throughout the day. Lift up your prayers to Him. Okay? Praise Him all these times. Cry out to Him all these times. And we see a perfect example of who models this? Daniel. Daniel used this faithful model even to the point of breaking the law of man. We see in Daniel 6, uh, verse 10, it reads, Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Even at the cost of being thrown into a den of lions, Daniel continued to do what he was supposed to do, even though he was breaking the law. That's how important prayer was to Daniel. And he didn't hide it. He knew that what he used to do was to keep his windows open while he was praying to the Lord, being a witness to others to see that faithfulness. And he didn't hide away, even when the law was signed. He continued praying. And church, this is time for us to ask ourselves, how important is prayer to you? We need to ask ourselves, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to have that ability to pray to God? Another thing we must consider, have we taken this for granted, this great opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one communication with the Lord of the universe, the Lord of all? Have we taken that for granted? Do we not realize this precious gift that we have? We must realize the importance of prayer, the cost that people were willing to pay, to, to pay just to be able to have the chance to pray. So whether we're going through persecution or we're not, we should fill our lives with consistent prayers to Him. The scriptures are clear that we are to pray each day and every day we must praise our God. Okay, so we're not just going up to God and asking Him for various requests like He's a genie in a bottle. Okay, and, and we're not just complaining to Him but we're also praising Him. It's so important to realize that we have to take time to praise Him. And it's not just from time to time, it's every day we should be praising our God. First Chronicles 23.30 reads, They are to stand every morning to thank and to praise the Lord and likewise at evening. Every day, morning and evening, and at noon, praise Him. Look at your life. Look at what He does. Realize that the breath that you're taking right now is a miracle. He is a sovereign God. And He has given you another breath. He has given you another day to work for Him. He has given you another opportunity to turn to Him. He is a merciful God and we should be in constant thanks to Him. I ask you to meditate on the words of the psalmist in Psalm 59, 16. But as for me, I shall sing of your strength. Remember, focus on his attributes, his amazing strength. Yes, I shall joyfully sing of your loving kindness in the morning. Praise him for his loving acts that he does, his mercies. For you have been my stronghold and a refuge in the day of my distress. He is our refuge. When we are going through distress, when it feels like our world is falling apart, when it feels like we have so much that we cannot handle, here's the reality. We're not going to be able to hold that weight. Many times, He allows us to continue to have such a heavy weight because as a loving Father, this is His way of leading us to Him, to focus on Him, to lean on Him. We need to lean on Him, and we best do that when we're in prayer, when we're in communication with Him. And now, this will take us to our third point, making time. Making time for prayer is so essential. So many times we hear different people complaining, oh, I don't have time to pray, I don't have time for the Bible. Trust me, you do have time. You have to make time. It, it's something you have to be intentional about. And it's something that is the most important things that you should be doing throughout your day. We conclude verse 35 and it reads, And went away to a secluded place and was praying there. 
In our translation, we're using the NASB, and we find that they use the word secluded. In the original Koine Greek, it is irumos, and it is rendered as desert, wilderness, desolate, deserted, solitary, and isolated in other English translations. So that just helps you to get an idea of how the word is used um, in English. This is the very same word that is used as wilderness when it is talking about what, when, where John is preaching, when we see earlier in the chapter in verse 4. And we also see this is the same word used when we're talking again earlier in the chapter in verse 12 of where Jesus was tempted. However, Mark's use of this word does not express a desert wasteland. It would not be appropriate to where Jesus was. It wasn't a desert wasteland where he went off. But in fact, it reflects Israel's journey into the wilderness following the Exodus. So it is a place of repentance, restoration, and fellowship with God. This is a place to prepare for great spiritual battles. To the believer, the secluded place is a war room. And that is how Jesus used it too. When he was embarking on his mission, when he was going through spiritual warfare, that's what he did. He went into a secluded place and he lifted up his prayers and he leaned on the direction of the Father and he was in perfect obedience to the Father because he heard from the Father and he followed the Father. And that is a perfect model for us to follow. A room where we can thank God for his faithfulness and seek his direction for our future. This is important for us to have this war room now, whether it's an actually a physical room or just a quiet place, a place by the lake, a place away from other people, it's important for us to have a place where we can thank God for his great faithfulness and we can also seek his direction. If we are not praying, how are we seeking his direction? And if we're not seeking his direction, then whose direction are we following? Because we're following somebody's direction. Is it our own? Are we following the world? If we're following him, we must be in prayer. And we must pray to him in our war room. Jesus was constantly in prayer as we see throughout scripture. Mark 6, 46 reads, After bidding them farewell, he left the mountain to pray. Jesus also spent whole nights in prayer. Luke 6, 12 reads, It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Look, when we are seeking his direction, sometimes we have to, it's as if we're wrestling with God, okay? And we're seeking his direction. We're begging him and we're pleading with him, Lord, show me what I am to do next, okay? If we have a burden, okay, a struggle with a sin, you know, something that we, we need to lift up to him, we cry out to him, okay? Maybe it's just reflections on all the miracles he has done for you. When you finally see that one thing after one thing after one thing was all leading up to something amazing that God did for you. And then you're thanking him and you're reflecting back, Lord, I can't believe when you did this and when you did this and this, where I thought it was something bad happening to me. In fact, you are setting me on the right road. You disciplined me here and I thank you for it because now I see what my life could have been. And just spending that time in constant thanks and gratitude to our mighty and sovereign God. And Jesus often prayed when his work was done and the day, uh, when his work was done for the day and in preparation for the following day. Again, relying on God's direction. Okay, that's why it's important to pray throughout the day. Okay, you pray for him as you're going to embark on that new day. You pray for, to him during the day to help you to get through the day. And then at night you thank him, you praise him, and then you ask him for help for the next day. Matthew 14, 23 reads, After he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Jesus was very intentional, as we can see here, about finding time to pray. He was so intentional, he would even find opportunities to slip away so he could find time to pray. And that's important for us to ask, how intentional are we about our prayer? To what length do we go to find time to pray. Luke 5, 16 reads, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. 
This is such a beautiful verse for us to really meditate on. He would often slip away, look for opportunities where he'd go, okay, I can slip away here. Okay, and this is, we're talking about God on earth. God incarnate would rely on the Father's direction. And how about us who are finite? How about us who are weak? How about us who are sinners? Shouldn't we even more so seek the Father's direction? Shouldn't we follow the example of our Master and follow Him and slip away as much as we can to seek the Father's direction? He also modeled this behavior for His disciples. Although Jesus was frequently alone in His time of prayer, He did at times bring along His closest disciples. We see this in Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on a mountain to pray. And his disciples we see, when they're observing him, how often he would pray, the disciples also humbly asked, Lord, how are we to pray? Luke 11, 1, it reads, It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. So here, and we'll get into it um, in a little bit, how Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer. And he showed us the importance of prayer. And that's important for us to realize too. As believers, as we are maturing, as we are now discipling others, because that's what we're called to do. That was what the Great Commission is all about. Yes, we're evangelizing, and we're not just evangelizing to bring people to church and leave them alone. We are supposed to disciple them. That means to disciple them to the point where they can create other disciples too. And the best way to do that Okay, is to teach them the word of God and to teach them how to pray. And we see that John the Baptist taught his disciples. We see Jesus taught his disciples. And through that, we have been taught how to pray. And we are to share that with others, especially those who become new to the faith. But even those who have been in the faith for so long, but maybe they just need help on how to pray. I often hear people tell me, how do I pray exactly? You know, I'm not sure if I'm praying right. You know, and we can always turn to Scripture to see that model. And we're about to get into that in, into more detail. We also see that Jesus prayed before everything he did, including his ultimate task, his ultimate mission, when he volunteered his life for the sheep. We see here in Mark 14, 32, it reads, They came to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. So as Jesus is facing the cross and getting ready to spiritually and mentally be prepared to be crucified, to be crushed by the Father, what he thought of doing first, what was his priority with his last minutes before he would be arrested, he was spending his time, hours in prayer, pleading with the Father. And his prayer can be modeled for us in all our requests to the Father. Matthew 26, uh, 39 reads, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. This cup that Jesus was talking about is the cup of judgment from the Father that would be poured down on Him. And He would have to drink that cup of wrath. And He knew the cost. And He asked if there was just any other way it can be done. But there wasn't. And that's what I love about what Jesus says here. Not my will, but your will. When we are pleading our pleas to the Father. We may make our requests. We may say, Lord, please give us this or please take this away from us. But we always have to remember, not our will, but His will. May His will be done. If that means we may suffer more, may His will be done. Because He knows what's best. And we have to put our trust in Him. And we have to really mean that. Not that when we don't get our way, we're angry at God because he didn't act like a genie for us. No. If we put our trust in him, that means we trust in what he's going to do. 
And we trust in his promises in the scriptures that all things will work out for those who put their trust in him. We have to remember that. And we have to follow the example of our master, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and realize when we pray to the Father, it is not our will we are looking to have accomplished. No. We are looking for his will to be accomplished. We are seeking his will and his direction. Consider this, please. The brother of a seminary student came to visit him one day. Unsure of the directions, he turned to the first person who passed him by and asked, Is this Davidson Hall? On hearing the man described later, the seminary student asked his brother if he had realized that he had been talking to a world-famous theologian. The brother couldn't believe it. He had the opportunity to ask any question, and he asked only for where a building was. Unfortunately, that's how many of us pray. We talk to God and ask for inane little things that are really insignificant. Really, we have to focus on praying for the things that matter the most. We need to pray that that person that you know, that you are sure that they're not saved, that they don't have a relationship with God, that their hearts are softened. You know, we need to do the prayers that, Lord, search us. Reveal to us our sins because we are so blind to our own sins so often that we need to ask him. But what does he tell us? We have not because we ask not. The sin may not be revealed to us because we never asked for it. What about that person's heart that we pray for them to be softened? Only God can soften a heart, but we are to be faithful to pray that someone's heart may be softened. We are to be faithful to pray for direction in our lives. We need to pray for the most important things. Not just these little things. Not like, oh Lord, I really want this. You know, no. We need to pray for direction from Him on what we're supposed to do under things that really matter. The things that will really build up our treasures in heaven. The things that are eternal. That should be our focus. What a shame that we would spend our times talking to God and not pray about anything significant. So please, reevaluate your prayers and prioritize them correctly and realize you are speaking with the King of Kings, the God of the universe, the sovereign and mighty and holy and awesome God. You have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Him. That is amazing. And the only reason that you can have that access is because of the sacrifice of Jesus that great sacrifice that was paid, that now we can boldly walk to the throne and make our requests. And he's a loving father and he will listen. So make your requests and pray for his will to be done. So as we start to close the service, please consider the parable that Jesus shared. In Luke 18, 9 through 14, it reads, and he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed, and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes on all that I get, but the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is powerful. This is just something that we should really meditate on, on how our prayers really should be. You need to realize who we really are, how sinful we are, the crimes that we commit against our mighty God. And do not approach our God with a prideful manner. Do not approach Him with pride. He pushes away the prideful. No. You approach our God in humility. You confess your sins to Him. You plead to Him for His mercy. 
you come to him and you praise him and you worship him and you focus on him and you search out his direction on your life. You search out his will and you pray that his will be done. Consider also how Jesus commands us to pray. In Matthew 6, verses 5 to 7, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Prayer is not meant to be entertainment. Okay, we are not to do this to be sh showing off our mad skills and how we can pray. Okay, that's not what we're called to do. Okay, and it continues. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Don't you have faith in Him? You don't need to show off to the world. He sees you in secret. Cry out to Him in your war room. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. We're not called here to just keep repeating things and to blindly um, keep chanting things. No. He is your Father. He wants to hear from you. Pray from your heart. Seek His will. I want us to also consider the ultimate model of prayer as we were referencing before, the Lord's Prayer. This is the prayer that Jesus used to teach his disciples. And this is a prayer that, yes, we can repeat it word for word, but we are really meant, the, the really meant to use this as a model. Let's look at Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Pray then in this way. See, notice even what Jesus says. Pray then in this way. Not necessarily to say these exact words. This is, again, meant to be a model. So it's really helpful to go just line by line and see what Jesus is praying for here. And that helps us to realize how we should be praying in our own words as we speak to our Father. And it continues, the passage continues. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Praise Him. Praise His name. Just meditate on all the different names of the Lord. And praise Him. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, as the Lord has His will done in the heavens. Okay, we want that His desired will to be done here. Now, He's a sovereign God, okay? He's in complete control. But our Father has a desire for certain things to be done. And although He's in control... We want his actual desires to take place. He wants all sinners to repent. Okay, now that's not, that's not going to happen. We know not everybody's going to repent, but that is his desire. So we pray that his desire is done. We pray for his desires, not our desires, his desires. In fact, what will happen is our old desires will go away and his desires will be placed on our heart and that will become a burden for us and that we will have those desires that he has. That as we see sinners who refuse to turn from God, our hearts will break just as his heart breaks. And as we see those who we know desperately need the word of God, we are passionate to share with them the word of God because that's what he is passionate about. We want to have his desires. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, we need to pray for him and realize that we need to pray for the things that we need on a daily need. Okay, we're not just saying, hey, give us food for the rest of our lives. No, we pray every single day that he will provide. And he will provide. But we must thank him and praise him and pray to him for all our daily things that we have because we have to remember what to be thankful for. You should be thankful for that breath that you just took. You should be thankful for the health that you have. You should be thankful for the abilities that you have right now the job that you have, the family that you have, the blessings that you have in your life. Thank Him for everything. And remember that He is the one who provides you with your sustenance. He is the one who provides you with your daily bread. Remember who is the one who is sovereign, who is the one in control, 
and pray to him. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now this is such a powerful uh, verse right here. And forgive us our debts. That part is so crucial. But notice what it says afterwards. As we have forgiven our debtors, it assumes, here just assumes, that we have already forgiven those who have done harm to us. Because if you have been shown grace by the mighty God, and if you realize just how much of a sinner you are, and how much you offend the holy God, you realize how wicked you were, and how holy He is, you have that heart that you can't hold anything against anybody, because whatever sin they do to you, will never compare to the sin that you've done to God. So he assumes here that you have already forgiven them. And none of us are perfect. Every single day we sin a myriad of times. And we have to come to him and plead to him, Lord, forgive us of our sins. And let's not be hypocrites, church. And remember as we have already forgiven our brothers and sisters, as we have already forgiven the world, as we have forgiven those who harm us and who hate us and who hurt us and who want to wish us harm, we must forgive those others. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay? We know that He is the one who will deliver us. It is not by our own strength. It's not by our own abilities, not by our own merit. When we are going through spiritual warfare, when we are going through the storm, pray to Him. He will be the one to guide us through it. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is how we should pray. This is the model for how our prayers should be when we're pleading to Him. Use this as your template for your prayers. And finally, church, I want to leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Rejoice always. And just right there, let's just pause right there. Rejoice always. That means in everything you go through. Things that you think are actually bad situations. Rejoice. Always praise Him. Rejoice always. Next, pray without ceasing. What does that look like? What does it look like to pray without ceasing? Everything that you're going to do through life, consistently pray to Him. Even if it's a short, quick prayer. Ask Him for His guidance in everything that you do. No matter how small or trivial it seems, ask Him for His guidance and His help. You want to be following His direction. And you want to be in this constant state of prayer, consistently seeking His direction, seeking His will, following Him. The more communication you have with Him, the better. Tell me, who, if they had a direct line to speak to the most powerful person, say the President of the United States of America, who wouldn't take that opportunity? A person who would listen, you could speak to him directly and, and tell him and, and, and share with him your, your ideas or whatever you wanted to share with the most powerful person in the country. But I tell you, we have a king of kings who's more powerful than anyone in this world. And you have direct access to him. So pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Again, he reiterates here, in everything give thanks. Thank him. Thank him for it all. You never know what he's exactly doing. Sometimes he reveals it and sometimes you won't see it until you're in that next life. But thank him always, for he'll always turn for good for those who put their trust in him. So I plead with you this week as you go through, reevaluate your prayer lives. Okay? Pray to Him. Pray to Him often. Pray to Him always. Lean on Him. Seek His will to be done. All the glory to our mighty God. Amen.
Great is thy faithfulness.